Australian Government's ANZAC Centenary Local Grant Scheme. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this public event called Gallipoli in retrospect. Um, before proceeding, I'd also like to acknowledge the Wadharong people, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. We thank them and their, their elders past and present for their care of the land. Today is an event, um, it will be the first of several events um, under the sponsorship of the Australian Government's ANZAC Centenary Scheme. Uh, and today we're, we're focusing on Gallipoli in retrospect, as the title suggests, recalling that the main evacuation of ANZAC troops from Gallipoli occurred, um, I think most of the troops from memory were taken off between around 9 to 18 December and all were gone by the evening of the 20th. So we are standing, sitting, um, in the context of something of an anniversary. We have three today, we have three related perspectives, and I'm sure you'll find them both stimulating and also interesting for their interconnectedness too. One is the perspective from Geelong, Geelong and Gallipoli, which is not a story we often hear. Another is reflections on the campaign and its standing among historians and in popular folklore. And the other perspective is Gallipoli and the private war at home, especially with a sensitivity to um, levels of support, the uh, emotions attaching to soldiers serving overseas, including um, grieving as well. I'd also like to welcome um, a number of groups um, who've joined us today, uh, people from Geelong RSL, Akis Marsh Grammar, Clonard College, Maris Sion College and Heighton Rotary. And I think we'll get started. Victory, a reflection on popular misconceptions about the Gallipoli campaign. And Dr Dale Blair has written three books and numerous articles about Australia's involvement in the First World War, including his groundbreaking Dinkum Diggers, an Australian battalion at war. He's taught Australian First and Second World War studies at Deakin over the past 15 years. And he's visited Gallipoli on two occasions, most recently, quite recently, during the Anzac centenary when he worked as a, a battlefield guide. Thanks very much, Dale. Uh, thanks, Matt, too, for a, a wonderful talk. Uh, always hard to follow. <coughs> um, I also want to add to the groups that are here, the American Civil War Roundtable of Australia. There's a number of members from that group here, so thanks, guys, for, for making the journey. Um, I'm sure we're a learned audience, and there's many people here that have got a distinct view of what Gallipoli is and what Australia's role was uh, within that. A century on, though, I'm, I'm trusting that uh, there's no one here, out here that's as uh, ignorant as uh, Alan Bond was uh, when he declared after the uh, 1983 America's Cup that this was the greatest victory, Australian victory, uh, since Gallipoli. <laughs> and history tells us that uh, Alan Bond, Bond had a little bit of a problem with memory, especially under oath. Uh, but uh, in his defence, he probably never claimed to be a military historian. And uh, given the disproportionate uh, attention that Gallipoli receives uh, in our national discourse, it's, uh, he could be forgiven, perhaps, for thinking it was a victory. So this afternoon we are nominally uh, celebrating or commemorating uh, the end of the Gallipoli campaign. The last Australian troops, as David uh, mentioned earlier, left the Anzac position on the night of the 19th and 20th of December without the loss of a single man, so it was uh, a truly remarkable feat. Uh, ironically, the evacuation proved the most unequivocal success of the whole campaign, which was uh, a spectacular failure, failing to uh, gain its objectives. This is a photograph of uh, the evacuation, and just uh, take a look at that, and um, bear in mind just how denuded the, the landscape is. I'm going to talk a little bit later about the vegetation, but just hold that image in mind uh, about that. So very briefly, just to give you a bit of context of the campaign, there was a stalemate on the Western Front uh, very early in 1915 and the Allied leaders thought that, uh, well, they were looking for an opportunity to break that deadlock and uh, they thought that uh, that deadlock 
and a, a decisive advantage might be gained in attacking Turkey. So the landings of the 25th of April, of which the Anzacs took part, were born of a failure of the British and the French fleets to actually force the, uh, the Dardanelles Straits. Uh, which occurred in February and March of uh, 1915. And this is a, a map of the peninsula. You can see here the position at, uh, down the bottom is Cape Hells, where the, the British initially landed uh, and later the French forces came over to assist there. The orange, of course, is the original Anzac position. The blue is the expanded Anzac position after the August offensives, uh, which is the second offensive at Gallipoli. And the green is the Suvla Bay area after they landed at Suvla Bay, uh, the British landed at Suvla Bay. And very briefly, what the, uh, the, uh, the strategy was, the British would push up, and initially at least, the British would push up the peninsula, the toe of the peninsula, toward um, uh, Echibat, which was called Maidos at the time, uh, get behind all the forts uh, that existed along the Straits and the Australians would uh, move across to Mel Tepe and threaten uh, Maidos, or modern day Echibat. Really simple, you know, snare the Turkish army in there or force their retreat from the peninsula and thus the abandonment of the, uh, of the uh, Turkish forts uh, and allow passage for the fleet into the, um, uh, the Sea of Mamara. So this afternoon uh, I want to address the question of... Um, whether the campaign could have succeeded or not. And given that it didn't, to suggest some of the reasons for that failure. And while we're doing that, in doing that, uh, I'll also address a number of the misconceptions that have uh, grown up about this campaign over the years and have, that have informed our popular understandings, if you like. The first of those uh, misunderstandings is that uh, the Australians were not the only troops at Gallipoli, okay? They, in fact, represented, re represented only about 20% uh, of the 78,000 Allied troops that were allocated uh, for the uh, land invasion. The Anzac position, however, was predominantly Australian, and in that sense it was quite distinct. But they were also supported, obviously, by the New Zealand troops, other British troops and Indian troops as well, as well as the combined uh, fleets of uh, the French and British navies. There was an opposition. It was commanded by uh, General Leon or Otto Liam von Sanders. He's a German commander and he commanded the Turkish Fifth Army. And the Fifth Army comprised of six divisions, uh, Turkish divisions, and it numbered between 80 to 100,000 troops. But the Turks were presented with a dilemma from the outset uh, once the, it became obvious that there would be a, a land campaign. And that was that they had to defend a coastline of over 100 kilometres. So to defend that, von Sanders had to spread out his army. And this he did by placing two divisions up to the north, the Gulf of Saros, two divisions uh, on the peninsula, and then two divisions also on the other side of the Straits and the Asian side of, uh, the, uh, of Turkey or the Ottoman Empire and they were from uh, uh, the Kumkal area and further south. Kumkal is where, of course, um, just up from that is where Troy uh, uh, is actually located. So of particular interest um, to the Anzac story uh, is the two divisions that are occupying the uh, peninsula. And that is uh, Mustafa Kemal's 19th Division, which is situated five kilometres north of the Anzac position uh, at a place called Bigali, or Bagali as it's sometimes known as well, and Halil Semi Bay's 9th Division, which is uh, spread out from Garba Tepe all the way down to Cape Hells and across to Maidos. So that, that division, 9th Division, is occupying that area. And the Turkish strategy was to defend in depth, and that meant that they would hold their main forces in reserve and they would only uh, distribute small units or deploy small units at the likely landing places, and then they would counterattack uh, once they understood exactly where the Allies were going to come ashore. The Turks allocated a single battalion from the 27th Regiment of the uh, 9th Division to defend an area of 12 kilometres. So a single battalion, uh, which numbers about uh, 800 men. And they were going to defend that 12 kilometre sector of which Anzac was a part. And at Anzac Cove and North Beach, which are the areas where the Anzacs actually land on the 25th of April, there were only 300 Turkish defenders. All right. So when the Australians came ashore 
the, the covering force of 1,500 men, it actually enjoyed a 5 to 1 advantage on the Turks defending those beach areas. So with the landing, we confront two of the biggest myths of Gallipoli. The first is whether the Anzacs were landed at the wrong beach. The old tale is that a current took them a mile offshore, uh, sorry, off course to the north. Uh, this is now universally dismissed by uh, military experts of the campaign. The Royal, Cam uh, the Royal Navy had state-of-the-art equipment. They could measure all these things. They'd been sailing these waters for many years. The midshipmen on the boats that guided the men in were expert at their craft. Uh, the official records tell us that there was no current uh, on, that, uh, on that morning. And what we do know is that two deliberate changes, four points, 45 degrees as it turns out, were made as the, as the uh, forces, as the force, first wave made its way toward uh, the coastline and landed at Anzac Cave. A deliberate change, of course. What we do know is that the outline of the coast could be distinctly seen 15 minutes from the time that those boats hit the shore. So there could be no misunderstanding where the actual beach landing was going to be. It was distinct. And it was going to be at Brighton Beach was the intended landing point, which is a little bit further south of Anzac Cove. It's a lot lower there and, uh, and easier uh, to uh, traverse. What we don't know is when the orders promulgating that change occurred or from whom they came from. What we do know is that correspondence between the senior commanders made it clear that the terrain that was encountered was no surprise to them, but the Turkish resistance was. And uh, if you're wanting to um, find a bit more about that, an excellent book is Dennis Winter's 25th uh, of April, The Inevitable Tragedy, in which he examines uh, uh, the plans of the, of the landing, etc. So I'd recommend that to anyone wanting to follow that, uh, that up. So why land at Anzac Cove? If it was easy, going to be easier at Brighton Beach, why land at Anzac Cove? Well, the first thing is it was screened from direct fire from Garba Tepe. The, Garba, the, the Turkish artillery was placed at Garba Tepe, uh, and from that position you cannot actually see Anzac Cove. So you've got protection uh, from, the, from the guns. The second was that just prior to the, uh, the few days prior to the... Uh, the, the scheduled landing, the High Command was becoming increasingly alarmed about Turkish trenches uh, that were appearing at uh, Brighton Beach. And they felt, with the, given the experience of, uh, of France and Belgium, that uh, these may well prove too strong to overcome. So this was uh, one of the reasons uh, put forward as a possible reason for the change. The second myth of the landing pertains, uh, or misconception, pertains to the nature of the fighting itself. That the Australians charged ashore under heavy machine gun fire and stormed the heights with their bayonets fixed and drove the, the Turks out of their trenches. The Anzacs did not, for the most part, have to fight their way off the beach, saving Private Ryan style, or as the British had to do at uh, V and W beaches at Cape Hells. Some of the Australians attempting to land a little north at uh, Fisherman's Hut uh, and North Beach certainly did do it tough, no doubt about that. But for the most part in the half-light, the firing that was being received was desultory and, as I said, there was no direct fire coming from the Turkish guns uh, on the landing boats. The Turks' tactics, too, were to fall back on prepared defences. And these they had up at Pluggy's Plateau, uh, up on the second ridge and also at Walker's Ridge. And we'll point those out a little bit, uh, bit later. Their idea was to delay the attackers uh, as much as they could and then fall back on these, uh, these positions and await for reinforcements. And to give you a sense of uh, some of the, um, um, uh, the differences in uh, the, the landing, the experiences of some of the soldiers, one of the groups of the, uh, that landed around Queensland at Point, so the 9th or 10th Battalion, they actually discovered a group of six Turks sitting down having coffee in a hut when they came ashore, and they bayoneted those six Turks. So those six Turks had no idea what was happening right, when, those, when those guys got ashore. So you can see that from the outset there are various um, experiences uh, and levels of resistance that were met uh, by the various landing boats. The Australians were certainly not under machine gun fire. 
And it's now generally accepted, thanks to a number of recent Turkish studies, uh, that no machine guns were at Anzac until late in the morning uh, when their reinforcements begin to, uh, begin to arrive. They had a machine gun company uh, down at Maidos and also the uh, 19th Division, which is Kamal's uh, division, also has machine guns, but not at the beach areas and those, uh, those, those areas. Yet this idea that the Anzacs charged the shore under machine gun fire or murderous machine gun fire with fixed bayonets driving the Turks is still presented to us. And most recently uh, in the ABC series Deadline Gallipoli about the war correspondence, uh, Charles Bean was shown coming ashore, Charles Bean being the war correspondent and the, later the official historian, he was showing coming ashore uh, in the third wave three hours after the initial landing. All right. And by that time, Anzac Cove was in fact truly secured, not under direct fire. Yet in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in this depiction in, in Deadline Gallipoli, we have men jumping out of the boats with fixed bayonets, charging up to the shore and getting shot down. Uh, the deadliest fighting um, at Anzac actually occurs inland on the second ridge uh, as the morning progresses. But also, although certainly once daylight uh, occurred, uh, the landing boats that were coming in in the later waves were under a shrapnel fire from the Turkish guns, uh, as was Anzac Cove and as it was uh, throughout the, um, the, the campaign. This photograph is actually taken by C.W. Bean. And it's taken around about 7.30 in the morning because that's when he came in with the 1st Brigade. And those three chaps in the front are probably engineers, probably from the second field engineers. And they would have been uh, in those, um, uh, in the front of the landing boats. And he's carrying a canvas roll which would be thrown over the, um, uh, thrown over barbed wire that they were expecting to, um, uh, to encounter. You see one guy is carrying a shovel. And then this photo, <coughs> is um, taken obviously a little later as well and gives an idea uh, of the scene uh, at Anzac Cove on about 7.30. The figure at the in the front here, you can see here, is a dead Australian engineer. His name is Fred Reynolds from the First Field Company of Engineers. And you can see here in that stretch of probably about 30 metres is the only dead body you can see. So we are, we're not talking about windrows of, of dead here at, at Anzac Cove. You can also see these soldiers in the foreground waiting. They've still got their blanket rolls on. They're waiting for others from their unit probably to get ashore. So it doesn't convey a lot of urgency, although, of course, there would have been urgency there. But uh, just in that, you can see it's, it seems to be quite calm and things are quite ordered uh, in, that, in that landing uh, there. Fred Reynolds, uh, and I'll just tell this quick little story about him. Um, he was a, a, a surf lifesaver. He enlisted at Queenscliff in New South Wales, in Sydney. And I was uh, fortunate uh, on one of the tours I uh, uh, had in April to have a lady whose, um, whose grandfather was also part of the First Field Engineers. Uh, and he, she brought his diary in which we, she read the entry from the 25th of April while we were at Ari Banu. Uh, which is lovely, but his regimental number is the one after Fred Reynolds, and he too enlisted at Queenscliff, so those two probably enlisted together um, <clears throat> at that. And the field engineers, if you look, look up the uh, official history, you won't find any mention of them at the landing. They're not mentioned in any battalion histories. They're not mentioned in any of the most recent uh, histories of the Gallipoli landings. The group, uh, any book on Gallipoli up till this point in time does not even talk about these guys. We're told that the Queenslanders were the first ashore at Anzac. All right? and that's why Queensland Point gets its name. All right? But these guys were distributed in every landing boat at the prow of the boat uh, in the pinnaces and they were the first ones ashore uh, at Gallipoli. But they're written out of the history and thanks to Carolyn Jones who's done some fantastic research, uh, the former ABC uh, Journalist. In fact, 60 Minutes had a little 20 minute special, which some people might have seen uh, on Anzac, uh, around Anzac time, about those guys. So it's, uh, you can rest assured that they'll be in every book about Gallipoli from, from this point on. Right. Um, so, on the morning of the 25th of April, 
the objective of the Anzacs was, was that the covering force would push in land. This is a very sketch map of, of Anzac. The covering force would push in land toward the second ridge and Sari Bear Range, uh, and the rest of the force would land, consolidate, and then drive the Turks back. Uh, the most pro prominent point uh, on the Sari Bear Range is actually Hill 971, which is uh, up there in the corner. Uh, and it goes something like this. The, the high ground goes from uh, 400 Plateau, which is where Lone Pine and Johnson's Jolly is, up to Baby 700, Battleship Hill, Chunuk Bear, Hill 971, and then beyond that, Hill Q. Right, this is the range, uh, the high ground that they had to, uh, had to take. From Anzac Cove to Hill 971 is about three kilometres. From Anzac Cove to the third ridge, which is this uh, ridge which rings the whole land's position comes in behind the range, uh, is about three kilometres as well. By 7.30, there are 12,000 Australians on shore at Gallipoli. 12,000. The first Turkish reinforcements do not begin to reach the battlefield and they've reached the third ridge at about that time. And that comprises of about 2,000 men uh, who are marching up from Maidos. Mustafa Kemal's division, which gets all the plaudits at Gallipoli, uh, both in our accounts and the Turkish accounts up until this point in time, does not begin to arrive until about 10am. By day's end, the Anzacs have not taken their initial objective, nor have the British taken theirs at Cape Hells. So if there was any real hope of success... Uh, on the morning of the 25th of April, it had clearly evaporated by the uh, close of day. Two other popular beliefs uh, that I'll touch on before moving on to the reasons why. Uh, the first is the British landing at Suvla Bay. The British failure at Suvla has been depicted, and this occurs in August, uh, has been depicted as a gross undermining of the Australian attacks at the Neck and Lone Pine. Think about the film Gallipoli. Right? and the depiction that occurs in that. I'm sure you're familiar with it. That the Australians charged to their death, um, unsupported while the British sat on the beach drinking cups of tea. Well, certainly at Suvla, uh, the operation suffered from a, a, lo a loss of initiative, as had the initial landings on the 25th of April. But the main purpose of the Suvla la uh, landing was to set up a new supply base. And it did, in fact, hold thousands of Turks in place in the Anafata range uh, that had to oppose that landing and could not be used elsewhere. The Australian assaults at the Neck and Lone Pine were actually made to support the New Zealand attack on Chunuk Bear. That was their purpose. And to stop, it, uh, stop troops going up to, uh, uh, to confront the New Zealanders. So Suvla was quite a separate venture to, to the, those attacks. So uh, the British, I think, have been unfairly maligned uh, in, that, in that sense. It has also become, uh, to move on to a second point, it has also become popular to believe that the Australians and Turks forged a special empathetic uh, relationship in the trenches, free of animosity, especially after the mass Turkish attacks of 19th of May. And this is really a part of a post-war narrative of goodwill and shared memory, right? Yes, you can find examples of Australians tossing cans into the uh, bully beef into the Turkish trench, tr trenches, exchanging gifts, expressing empathy in some of their diaries, but it's hardly, it hardly mirrored a general benevolence toward the enemy. Soldiers such as Archie Barwick uh, from the 1st Battalion wrote of their frustration during the armistice at being so close to the Turks yet not being able to kill all the bastards. Australian troops, on their evacuation, set booby traps and, as a result, killed about 70 Turks, uh, a point that the Turks um, you know, uh, drew ex expressions of disgust, if you like, from the Turks uh, after the war. But it's an example of how our understandings of the campaign are actually shaped or distorted by modern agendas, if you like. <coughs> to the broad question of whether the campaign could have succeeded? The short answer is no. Simply put, not enough men were made available to ensure a victory. 
and this was due in part to the rush planning of the campaign. Gallipoli was the biggest seaborne invasion in military history to that point in time. It was organised in six weeks. D-Day, by comparison, took 12 months of meticulous planning and it, to be sure, was a, a much larger operation as the Gallipoli invasion needed to be. An underlying factor to the planning was that the quality and we saw this uh, in Matt's talk, uh, uh, that the quality of the Turkish military and navy was underestimated. Certainly due consideration was given to the problems the Turkish static defence might have uh, on uh, any initial attack, but it was thought that once engaged, the Turks would fold. And as Douglas Haig famously said, you know, they were just a pack of baji bazooks, which were old Turkish mercenaries historically. Uh, of ill discipline. More specifically, we might ask why the Anzacs failed, especially given that for the first four to six hours they significantly outnumbered the Turkish defenders. And there are, of course, a number of reasons. Landing at the wrong beach was not one of them. Turkish commanders and some of their troops were seasoned campaigners. Many had fought uh, in the Balkans War in, in the Balkan Wars of 1911-12. By comparison, only half the Australian force had military experience, militia experience, and most had no active military experience. And this was even more pronounced amongst the officer corps of the AIF. The terrain was particularly difficult. It was hilly. was covered in thick scrub, and the scrub was from four to six feet high, mostly. Uh, there's a lot more pine trees at uh, Gallipoli these days than there was at the time, but uh, this photograph is, um, is uh, actually taken from just the start of Walker's Ridge, and so if you're standing here looking at it, taking that photo, you can see down the, that white uh, Edifice down there is actually Lone Pine, the memorial, so that's the second ridge. Uh, and that's Monash Gully that we're looking at there. To your right is the neck, and to your left is an upper bit is uh, Baby 700, where the Turkish 57th memorial is, uh, which was the key to the battlefield because uh, Australians coming up the second ridge had to pass through that to get up to Hill 971 and the higher ground as troops coming from the North Beach up Walker's Ridge had to come through that position as well, but uh, more so for the, the foliage there. So, um, and it's particularly thorny as well, that's the other, th uh, the other thing about that. And even today, if you try to walk through that stuff, uh, it'll hold you up for, for ages. Uh, uh, and certainly if you ever get to Gallipoli, try it. Uh, <coughs> it's, it's well worth the effort. The Turks too were familiar with the ground. As I said, they had some prepared defences there uh, already. They trained on the ground. Uh, and in fact, the whole civilian population of that area of 30,000 uh, had been removed by the 10th of April so that they didn't impede uh, military operations on the peninsula. There was also no clear understanding among the lower echelon uh, Australian officers and the men themselves about what their plans were, about what their actual objectives were. And there was a plan, as I mentioned before, it was quite specific. Yet even with these excuses, we must ask why could not 12,000 Australians make their uh, objectives on that fateful morning? Their inexperience weighs in as a major factor. Men unused to fire or fighting for the first time quickly went to ground and became inert under fire. And they would remain so for long periods of time before they mustered their strength to, uh, to actually get themselves going again. Uh, as, um, there's this, this need to actually confront the danger first, get over your own personal um, fear, was something that all the soldiers had to, uh, had to contemplate and, uh, and conquer. And just as it was near impossible to see the enemy or locate the enemy in this, uh, in this scrub, so too was it difficult to see your own troops. Uh, and this caused considerable confusion. If, for instance, Matt, Bart and I were together and uh, we were told to lie down under cover fire because shrapnel fire and Bart was to my right and Matt was further to his right by four or five feet, I wouldn't see Matt. 
right, in some of these areas, it's that, it's that thick. If you think about that in terms of a section of men of 15 to 20 men and a combat officer trying to get his orders to them, uh, and they be could become quickly disoriented uh, under that thing. C.W. Bean does talk about that uh, in the official history. So there's considerable confusion, loss of direction. Command control was not effective uh, due to a lack of understanding of the objectives and also a lack of organisation and lack of experience. Shrapnel fire into the Anzac position caused significant disruption as troops scattered under it and thus formations were broken up uh, and had to be reformed before any advance could uh, be recommenced. And shrapnel is, uh, for those who don't know, it's a shell. It contains generally about 400 uh, lead pellets in it of about half-inch lead pellets, and it bursts overhead and scatters those, those pellets um, over, the, over the troops below. And as you walk around Anzac, you can actually still find those in the ground um, if you're lucky enough. Above all, though, the reasons... Above all the reasons, though, was the tenacity of the Turkish defenders. And Mustafa Kemal's uh, role uh, and the attack of the 57th Regiment that drove the Australians off Baby 700 uh, mid-morning and thus secured that key to the battlefield is well recorded. And a memorial of the 57th Battalion, uh, out of Turks, um, picture is everywhere in Turkey, uh, certainly around Chanakli, which is his sort of home territory. That's the 57th Memorial up on Baby 700. And that marks that spot. It's a vital, vital spot on the battlefield. And it's a, and it's a memorial well earned. You know, they certainly deserve that recognition. But less celebrated is Colonel Sefik's 27th Regiment. And they really are, from the Turkish perspective, the unsung heroes of uh, the Anzac sector. Many of those men were actually from Gallipoli, uh, from the Gallipoli region. So they, perhaps more than any others, were defending their homeland. Uh, it was the 2nd Battalion of that regiment that was defending the, the coastal area and the beaches at Anzac uh, initially. And the other two, um, uh, the other two uh, battalions were down at Mados, uh, numbering about 2,000 men. And that 1st Battalion fights for three hours unsupported as wave after wave of Australians come ashore. Right? It's a remarkable fight on their behalf. And uh, the reinforcements get there just in the nick of time. And those reinforcements that are coming uh, uh, with uh, Colonel Sefik, who commands the regiment from Matus, the night before they had undertaken field manoeuvres. They had arrived back at their camps at 3am on uh, the 25th of April. At 5am, Sefik received news that the uh, Allies have actually landed around the Garba Tepe position, the Anzac Cove. So he rouses his men up after two hours sleep, and probably not even that, and puts them on the road towards, um, uh, towards uh, the Garba Tepe position, Anzac Cove, at 6am. It's eight kilometres, and they make a forced march, push their way up through. There's a single goat track that they use. That comes under fire from the, uh, from the naval guns, the British naval guns, and so they actually forced it to go cross-country, and they make their ground. They begin to arrive uh, on the third ridge around about 7.30, and there they encounter some of the uh, early Australian patrols that have actually made that ground and pushed out to the third ridge and done remarkably well to get out there. But they overrun uh, uh, those men and bayonet most of them and those that uh, are able to fall back toward the second ridge. At 20 to 8, 7.40, Sefik sends these men towards the second ridge. And they start to make their way to the second ridge where numbers of Australians are now making their way uh, uh, to. And it's been, and so you get attack after attack there, counter attack, and eventually the Turks actually drive the Australians off the second ridge back to the western face of the ridge and they occupy the, the, uh, the eastern face. And it's often said that uh, the Australians, or it has been said, that this was the defining moment of the battle. That uh, Well, that's Sefik, sorry, I forgot to put him up before. Uh, the, the Australian commander on the spot is a fellow Scottish chap uh, by the name of Sinclair McLagan, and he makes the decision to start sending troops towards the second ridge to oppose this, uh, the Turks that have appeared on the third and are starting to move their way towards the second ridge, instead of directing the troops up the hill toward the high ground. 
So the question uh, that is often asked is, would gaining the high ground have ensured the success of the campaign? Well, it would have been helpful to be sure. But the Turkish army, provided it was reasonably intact, could have taken up other defensive positions that would have been uh, equally hard to, have, uh, remo uh, to remove them from. And as the Anzacs showed in their defence of their positions uh, over the three weeks after the landings, uh, a well dug in defensive position defended with modern weapons was a really hard nut to crack. Three weeks of Turkish attacks failed to drive the Anzacs into the sea as they, as they had hoped. So there's little reason to believe that the Allies would have fared much better if the, cap had, if the boot had been on the other foot. So 100 years on, how should we interpret the Gallipoli campaign? Well, first, it provided a salutary lesson in how not to run a campaign. And it provided valuable experience for the Australian Army uh, on how to conduct future operations and to improve its performance. Unfortunately, over the decades, a chauvinistic popular view has grown that has elevated the Australian in experience into something quite distinct uh, over that of its allies. It's a view that elevates the digger into something of a super soldier, and it holds that the Australian experience was distinct. In fact, when one reflects on the, the Australian experience, uh, the Australian experience, far from being distinct, it confirms the, univer uh, the universal truths of soldiering. The references to the indomitable Anzac spirit, which many in public life are prone to invoke on the totemic days of Anzac and Remembrance Day, are nothing more than the attitude that proliferated in all armies. Uh, and in the trenches across Europe. And it was shared by soldiers of the world. Dark trench humour, fortitude in adversity, stoicism against the odds, adaptability in deprived circumstances. Mateship, so religiously invoked as a defining Australian trait uh, of its soldiers and of general Australian character, was and is no different uh, to the comradeship exhibited in all armies whether it be a bond between chums, a bond between buddies, a bond re between comrades, it was the same thing. It was a necessary survival mechanism for soldiers at the front. We should continue to tell the story of Anzac. It's a great story. It's full of tragedy and triumph. But we should, we should also tell it free of the nationalistic trappings and jingoism that uh, sometimes accompanies it and is too often invoked. We should be aware that false eulogy actually compromises and endangers the, fact of the veracity of the truth. We should not be afraid to tell the story warts and all, and we should refrain from decrying those who point out uh, failings uh, in our beloved digger. He was a man after all, flawed, heroic sometimes, sometimes not. He was also not extraordinary. Millions of men the world over in two world wars, volunteered to go and fight in a cause they believed was just. That said, the generation to which he belonged, compared to our current, uh, our modern day experience, may seem extraordinary. Those centuries of warfare tells us that it wasn't. We should endeavour 100 years on to bring some humility and generosity to the spirit of our retelling of the Anzac story. It wasn't a sporting contest with a casualty list of some sort of macabre scoreboard. Oh, look, we killed more men than them. It was war, ugly in its intent and demeaning in its nature. If we want to be guided in how to uh, do so, we need to look no further uh, than the example of the Turks. The Turks actually incorporate a figure of an Australian soldier shaking hands with a Turkish soldier on one of the sculpted reliefs that adorn the Martyrs Memorial at Cape Hells, a national Martyrs Memorial because the Turks declared the war a jihad. You can see the Australian soldier there on the left. This is the memorial. I'll give you an idea of the size uh, of it. Built in the 1960s, probably around the 50th anniversary. And that is Cape Hells, and you can see just how big this thing, how it dominates the landscape, and it's lit up at night, and you can see it from Chinakali. Even more powerful, however, 
are the words attributed to Mustafa Kemal as Ataturk that greet visitors to Ari Banu, the northern point of Anzac Cove. And given the current hysteria regarding refugees and the terror threat, we do well to reflect on the generosity and humanity contained in these words from the leader of a Muslim country to the mothers of countries of Christian and other faiths whose sons had died invading his own. And the words are, I didn't write it there, but those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives, you are now li are lying in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore, rest in peace. There is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mamets to us where they lie side by side. Here in this country of our, uh, side by side here in this country of ours. You, the mothers who sent their sons from, the, uh, from far away countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace. After having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons as well. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome our first speaker, Matthew Richards, um, who's presenting a paper called No Socks for Cold Footers. It's an enigmatic um, title, Matt. Geelong and the Great War. Dr Matthew Richards is an academic with long connections with Deakin University, where he studied and taught for several years. He's a specialist in the early Commonwealth period in Australian history, with a PhD on perceptions and realities of race in the Trinity Bay area around Cairns. So we're looking forward to seeing this work published uh, as a book in the near future. Today he's turning his attention to the experience of Gallipoli here in Geelong. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you, David. And good afternoon, everyone. Terrific to see you all. Uh, yes, my paper is called uh, No Socks for Cold Footers, and some of you may have already worked out what that's about. Um, it's, from a, uh, it's from a newspaper article that I saw, and I thought it was kind of fascinating because it, but it, cause it connects to the, some of the debates that were going on locally about this, this wartime experience. All right, so this year, 2015, uh, the Geelong Advertiser featured, many, probably a lot of you saw this, lots of souvenir liftouts and ran countless articles in commemoration of the First World War centenary. Uh, it took a keen interest in the legend of Anzac as what, as historians might understand it, as a sort of Hegelian metaphor for, for the Australian national spirit. 100 years earlier, however, the advertiser's reportage in response to the war demonstrates considerably more complexity and nuance. Reflecting the social realities of the times, attitudes to the war found in this rich historical source, and newspapers really are, as far as historians are concerned, swirl with cross-currents of noble ideals, hard-headed concerns, and to the present-day reader steeped in Anzac mythologies, a surprising degree of ambivalence. I mean, this really did surprise me, the, the ambivalence that was there. The following represents an overview of the Geelong experience during the first, world, first years of, the, of World War II. It's taking a core sample from the Geelong Advertiser, okay? So to, to look at, to consider narratives, I'm looking at narratives of war, I'm not looking at the home front experience, I'm not looking at military campaigns, I'm looking at the way this was represented, the way this was debated in a newspaper sense, um, through the popular press. And as far as possible, so it's, it's, it's just chock-a-block with quotations, okay? I'm trying to allow those present at the time to tell their, explain themselves in their own words. All right. <clears throat> so in 1914, Geelong was a rural service centre of about 40,000 people. It was beset by drought and unemployment, and it was adrift in the economic doldrums of the early white Australia years. Rumours of war were circulating, triggering some outbursts of anti-Germanism and vague concerns about spying. But it's pretty clear, no patriotic fervour was yet in evidence, especially not in the first few months, and for much of the first year that was probably still true. Uh, with Germany's invasion of Belgium in July 1914, war in Europe finally broke. In August, Britain declared war on Germany and Australian support for empire was readied. Initially, the advertiser took 
what I think it can fairly be described as a detached interest in the military recruitment that was taking place locally. On one occasion, it barely mentions it. There's probably reasons for that, but uh, you know, it's not. It doesn't seem to be considered a hugely relevant series of events unfolding as far as Australia is concerned, at least not in the early early moments. Um, so on one, one occasion, it took the opportunity to uh, upgrade the sloths in the Geelong ranks who failed to attend drill regularly. So censorship and vast time lags and huge distances probably did very little to give Victorians any sense of the wars and media city. You know, this is happening on the other side of the world. But it's still remarkable to observe that for at least its first year, most Geelongites seem to consider the war to be a fight between standing armies, dug into trenches perhaps, but following the familiar colonial model in which Britain always triumphed. It was, furthermore, of little direct concern to Australia, except as a part of empire. I mean, this is not probably the way we remember this stuff, but this is how, you know, we're, this is unprecedented, so they're just trying to understand what's happening in the early days. Uh, during no, during 1914-15, greater journalistic attention was devoted to pressing local concerns, which namely were the calamitous drought. There was a two-year drought that was devastating for Geelong and local community and skyrocketing unemployment. Remember, this is a time when you know, the social safety net was not what we have today. <clears throat> Council was told around Geelong the crops had nearly gone and the position was worse up the, up the country. Prospects were extremely gloomy, unquote, and many people were beginning to feel the pinch. Official responses to this crisis Crisis were weak and ineffectual, and regional authorities were condemned for allowing men and women to starve. Now, Victorians were being asked to find money for a war effort. So, an exasperated editor asked, "How are we going to pay? For, how are we to pay for this war?" And nobody seemed to know. War in Europe, however, delivered an unlikely stroke of luck to Geelong. Salvation from semi-destitution and agricultural hardship emerged in the form of a dramatic escalation in wool and wheat prices. Government contracts setting local textiles mills roaring in the production of khaki. Now, I'm not sure, but I think this one might be included in that. <clears throat> and the possibilities of paid work in the army. They mention this. They mention this quite a bit. You know, there's, there's, you can make money, join the army. Uh, within a few short months, Geelong's grim prospects had reversed and the advertiser thrilled to sensational values as wool prices leapt from very firm to exceedingly good to extreme before it declared breathlessly, we are living in exciting times. Equipment of the world's armies has resulted in the biggest boom in wool as in many other commodities which has ever been known to Australian producers. That seems slightly at odds with how we might, we might think about 1914, but there you go. It is hoped, and by many believed, that whether our wheat crops are large or small, Europe will be compelled to buy them, and our beeves and mutton. Our factories hum and whir as they have never hummed and whirred before, with large profits accruing. Geelong Mayor Howard Hitchcock later reflected that for the duration of the war, at least so far as our sales of overseas exports of primary products was concerned, Geelong had much to be grateful for. So things may have been looking bright in Geelong, but in Europe a huge death toll was mounting and the horror of the machine age slaughter was becoming ever more apparent. The advertiser checked itself and began to counsel austerity and volunteerism as patriotic duties. Women of Geelong were urged to stitch, knit, stitch, and many responded with gusto. By late 1914, it was gleefully reported, our mercy is running riot. In every township, hands are busy making comforts for the troops. Already sufficient balaclavas have been knitted and enough shirts sewn to supply twice the number of men in the Australian contingent. Fundraising buffets were held and money was collected to buy tobacco for the troops. The Belgium Relief Fund raised a thousand pounds 
and a patriotic bale of wool donated by Miss A.G. Gordon sold for a record £1,023. All other patriotic efforts in Geelong were already well organised, he said. Our weak point is enlistments. The advertiser re reviewed Geelong's human contribution to the war in Europe. In, in November 1914, 20,000 uh, yes, 20, men of the first Australian Imperial Force had departed Australia. Eight months later, the advertiser calculated that from Geelong and surrounds, only about 100 had enlisted. So, fairly low number in the early days, according to these calculations. <clears throat> Fewer recruits have come from the country than from the towns in Victoria, it observed. This was to be expected. There are fewer unemployed in the provinces. But we want more, many more recruits. Parents and youths, it was thought, could be relied upon to respond to the stimuli of patriotism, pride of race and pocket. With the local economy quickly improving, however, the motive force of pocket was rapidly diminishing. An unnamed mother reported that her sons would not enlist because they were not out of work. Others argued, you cannot send this man to fight and die and leave his employer to the largest profits he can extract. Changed economic circumstances left imperial patriotism and pride of race as the remaining stimulants to recruitment. Lady Stanley visited Geelong. I don't know who Lady Stanley is. Somebody might be able to tell me. Who's that? Oh, OK. Fantastic. Thanks. <laughs> Good to ask an expert audience. Uh, visited Geelong and told the Red Cross Society that Australians must think imperially because it was their duty to keep unsullied that beautiful flag, which was the symbol of freedom across the British Empire. Britain has asked us to send every man we can, and the citizens of Geelong are invited to respond to the Empire's call. To amplify the call of empire, the advertiser proposed, in every town which has a band, could have an hour of rural Britannia in the evening. Arguments urging Australian recruitment assumed that Australian interests were inseparable from the interests of Imperial Britain, not simply as a matter of obligation, but as a national necessity. This war for us, it was said, is a war of self-preservation. By the thinking of the time, war was considered to be the ultimate test of racial fitness. The man who enlisted was described as being true to the glorious traditions of our race, but the man who did not was unworthy of the privileges which his parents and the race have conferred upon him. It's a pretty interesting language that was oh, 100 years ago. The advertiser assumed that mobilising for war would prove Australians to be a, a, a better strain of Britisher and nothing short of the finest people in the world. Uh, with dismay then, it was revealed that in Geelong, an extraordinary procession of young men have failed to pass the doc doc doctor's examination for recruits. The medical tests declared unfit those with heart, lung and kidney problems, poor eyesight, so I wouldn't have got in, alcoholism, oh there's another one, <laughs> the stooping habit, irrational feeding, deficient teeth, and bantams under five feet two. The fact that nearly half of all local applicants were turned around uh, on these grounds clearly upset some Australian sense of racial fitness. In this great continent, we have expected to develop a race of large-limbed men. Our sons ought to be patterns of physical beauty and vigour. Alas, for the truth... <clears throat> the advertiser did its best to contextualise the war by imagining it in the landscapes of the Ballerine Peninsula, Victoria and Australia. And I reckon there's an honest thesis in this for someone. It's, you could snap it up. It's really fascinating. The geography of war here, played out here. Um, Geelong troops are not making a generous gift to the motherland, it was said. They are armed to keep the foe from raiding Melbourne, bombarding Queenscliff, steaming up Cario Bay and holding Geelong to ransom. Readers were asked to picture peaceful citizens brutally assaulted by a gang of rogues at Frank's Corner or 
Lara and Geelong and Moolap bombarded to ashes. With growing anxiety, the advertiser reported, but for the might of the British Navy, Germany would assuredly have invaded this continent and we would see fighting in and, in and around Australia. A dozen submarines closing Port Phillip Bay against all shipping. Zeppelins raining death on our coastal towns, Geelong amongst the rest. Will our young men who still hesitate to enlist please note that this is our war. Men who refuse to volunteer, who refuse to go to camp, have really only one reason. This is the advertiser on the soapbox here. Uh, they are afraid, and a nation of cowards is a nation doomed. Not all seem convinced, however, that this was our war, or that Australia was doomed. One man told a recruiting agent that he would prefer to wait until the Germans came. An unnamed German was said to have described Australians as sport-loving sons of degenerate wasters. There was far too much local indifference for the liking of the advertiser. It lamented, if only our young men were as fond of shooting as they are of football. A great host of them stay at home at football matches, crowds of them cheering and unashamed. They lie on Eastern Beach and the pier to see the Adena off Every night, groups of them stand at street corners with no intention of doing their part. Writing from the front, JT Deer sardonically wished Germany to attack Australia. It seems a pity that the aeroplanes that have been doing such deadly work over London could not find their way to our football grounds, stadiums and race courses. There you go. <clears throat> can, can you give me a hurry up if I'm taking too long? Huh? That's, I've, got, no, it's, I've got a... Clock here. Fine. Fine. Okay, beautiful, yeah. beautiful. All right, I did a massive hack and slash on this this morning, but I'm not sure if I've hacked and slashed enough out of it. We'll see how we go. Uh, there was clearly nothing unequivocal, uh, unequivocal about Geelong's involvement in the war, which struck me as it was really interesting to read, read this stuff. Initially, the advertiser did not print counter arguments to Australia's participation. Later, it saw need to print them to disparage them. It acknowledged that men contemplating enlisting read, fit, read the 50th casualty list, see the names of friends and say, if I'd enlisted, I should very likely be in hospital by now or in a grave. They ask, why should I go and get hurt or killed? Quite reasonable questions, you might think. Some in Geelong contended that reasons for which, some contended that Reasons for which a man might decline to enlist are entirely matters for his own conscience. Some cited the sacredness of human life. Others said, this is a sordid war and another 100,000 of our men will not affect the issue. Or, it was stated plainly more than once, this is not my war. In Market Square, orators proclaimed, this is the king's war and the capitalists profit by it, so you can get a sense of the politics of the time. Such people were, in the view of the advertiser, here's another sense of the politics of the newspaper of that time, these people are just selfish, pigeon-livered, contemptible worms. <laughs> pigeon-livered, contemptible worms. Maddened by class consciousness and willfully talking nonsense. Class-conscious socialist and internationalist Jay Scurry told a meeting in Geelong... It's nonsense to say the Germans could come here. We are in much greater danger from those closer to our shores, the darlings of the exploiters, who would like to see the virile men sent out of Australia. Labourites argued that military service would empty the Commonwealth of men, so employers could introduce black men and Asiatics to reduce the wages of white men. Empire enthusiasts and empire sceptics found common cause in their anxieties about Asia. By the geopolitical orthodoxy of the time, the advertiser argued, we rely on the British Navy. If Eastern powers are to challenge our exclusion of Asiatics, can we ask, please Britain, come and protect us when in your hour of peril, we said no to your request. Attitudes to the war were clearly influenced by political and racial ideologies. The acute race consciousness of the, of the early 20th century Australia, of early 20th century Australia, found its way into correspondence from the front. The advertiser printed a letter from Private C.J. Spargo of Creswick. 
I saw a vote no card over here and on it was keep Australia white. Oh my God, if Australia was filled with men like the Gurkhas, it would be a lot better off than it is at present, overrun as it is with a lot of dirty, skulking curs. The lowest breed of nigger is better than the majority of Australia's present population. The best thing that could happen to Australia would be for the... Now I don't know how to say this. Torbs, Tower Bays, to, to plane, plane that drops bombs, Torbs, uh, and Zeps to come and drop bombs on every trades hall. <clears throat> so the nationalist exigencies of war played out through normative expectations of masculinity and femininity as well. Nonconformists were regaled as gender traitors. The basis of our national life, it was claimed is a supreme love of manliness. If we fight no more, we should be a coward and a traitor and a cold footer, there you go, the cold footer, who refused to play a man's part. Women were active participants in the war effort. They resisted and implored recruitment and engaged in public debates about its politics. Another soldier's sweetheart told the advertiser, I've already knitted... 176 pairs of socks for our brave boys, but not for cold footers. A true blue Anzac sister thought recruiting might be boosted by compelling those who would not enlist to wear the shirkers' petticoats up and down Moorable Street. A Somme hero's wife claimed to have heard men going up to the doctor for examination after smoking half a dozen packets of cigarettes, also rubbing their limbs with iodine. It's a bit like, you get buckets and bouquets in your local paper. <laughs> it's a bit like uh, um, where are we? Sister of three Anzac heroes asked, have the recruiting officers not pleaded with the eligibles, told them the gallant deeds of, deeds of our heroic boys, told them this is the life? A true blue Anzac sister demurred, arguing, those who did not enlist simply stand up for their rights. I'm a true blue Anzac, and I think the young fellows that are, that are here have a very good reason for not enlisting. Later, as months of war became years, others said, uh, it gets much nastier, we've had enough of this bloody war, and we've suffered enough. Casualty, casualty lists of Geelong and district soldiers were published regularly, as were letters from the front. Now, uh, the letters from the front have a very, very particular tenor to them. They're very uh, upbeat, optimistic, and it sounds like it's a great load of fun to be um, in a war zone. Uh, generally, yes, geared, it seems to me they're geared towards reassuring anxious family members. So, for example, from Gallipoli, a nonchalant Clive Newman told his parents... The war is, I presume, still going on. We hear very little about it here, but for occasional bit of gun practice by the Turks, we would imagine we're back in peaceful Geelong again. Another wrote, the troops at the front line are quite contented. JJ McSweeney said, he's enjoying the soldier's life immensely. On furlough, Sapper George Powell explained that he was keen to return to the front. With all the pleasures, one misses the good old comrades and does not like to be out of the game. Couldn't wait to get back amongst it. Many give the impression that the war was a great adventure, not to be missed. Others wrote lengthy travelogues. Uh, so, for example, oh, Nurse Mina Bromley certainly did. Um, I had to chop her quote right down because there's a lot of tales of what she saw in England. Um, what did she say? I love the work. I'm quite pleased at the prospect of a trip to England. I've been extraordinarily lucky to have such a varied experience. Sergeant A.L. Dardle wrote, so these are all Geelong people, well, we've left Anzac. It was hard to leave. We passed too many cemeteries on the way out. Altogether, we had a beastly time, a good time, and all sorts of times mixed up. Yet I would not have missed it for anything. There's certainly a darker side to these correspondences. Some of them seem coarse, at times cruel, and some of them jar against present-day racial sensibilities with stories of gravy-eyed niggers being given a hurry-up, for example. Others are contemptuous of those who have not enlisted, or they seem slightly unhinged, sometimes vainglorious and graceless, perhaps the result of unimaginable stress and horror. One writer in, recuperating in hospital was struck by the fact that he had not heard a natural spontaneous laugh for over four years. 
Another said he would almost welcome a wound, anything to get out of the range of the nerve-wracking sound of guns. Sergeant H.J. Fay composed a long and thoughtful letter to his parents, detailing the agony of the wait before a bayonet charge. With soldiers staring at photographs, trembling with fear, bloodlust, or jocular and emptied of all feeling on the brink of eternity, as he put it. After the charge and the frenzied, chaotic, gory exchange, Faye claimed, I'm myself again, a plain soldier of the king. But hinting at the psychological impact, another wrote, We were a callous, indifferent mob that left that peninsula. Colonel J.C. McPhee wrote of wrote Gallipoli, It was gruesome and horrible beyond all imagination. I hope most fervently I'll never see anything so awful again. With the Australian troops joining the attack on Turkey to open up the Dardanelles and seize Constantinople, I think Dale's going to tell you a bit about that, <clears throat> uh, the sense of expectation was, was immense. You can really, it's really palpable. To Australians well-versed in what we might think of as a nationalist reading of the Gallipoli experience, it's striking to discern the imperialist framing of the, of the early accounts. In February 1915, the advertiser hoped... We may read of exploits as fine by our Australian brigade as any that give glory to the annals of the British Army. It tends to be, it's not exactly the way we tend to think of it. How would, Australian, uh, how would the Australian troops perform? Exuding wild optimism, naivety, or perhaps by way of offering reassurance, the advertiser confidently predicted that Turkey, that Turkey is to disappear from the map of Europe. The Turkish army appears to have degenerated to the level of the Turkish navy, which is a laughing stock of Europe. It seems impossible the Turkish army should, should today have any, any cohesion, any loyalty, any patriotism. It will almost be a miracle if the Ottoman forces put up a stiff fight. Nevertheless, the advertiser added, hedging slightly, the impossible may happen. And as is well known, the seemingly impossible but in retrospect entirely foreseeable, did happen. Huge numbers of lives were lost to Turkish machine gun fire sweeping from the cliffs of Gallipoli. Uh, after some weeks, the most that could be said was the Anglo-French armies have accomplished marvels, but well, they've done little more than establish a footing on the peninsula. The advertiser put the scene in a local context. Our troops had to climb ascents almost as steep as the bluff at Barwon Heads. Are you picturing that route? <laughs> the bluff of Bowen Heads. And now a highland like Mount Moriac has to be captured. If we picture in the distance from the intersection of Colac and Mount Colite roads, cut by trenches at 50 yard intervals, we shall get a close idea of the field of battle, which is costing so many lives. In five weeks, the Allies had progressed to about as far as the Exelsoir Mill. This is, this is the Addy talking here. Uh, on the Barwon, to the Anglican Church, on the way to the Belmont Post Office. Now, I've never heard the story of um, Gallipoli compared to a trip to the Belmont Post Office before, but there you go. Bitter recriminations began to bubble up. This is madness, it was declared. That's the ad Addy talking from its empire enthusiasm to, to starting to call it madness. Perhaps the Dardanelles adventure must be cancelled. Well... Every war is marked by grave miscalculations. Winston Churchill prophesied that, uh, this is the Addy talking again, that a world-shaking victory was to be expected in a few days on the Gallipoli Peninsula. But nothing happened. The newspaper began to apportion blame. Gallipoli is Britain's job. Britain suggested the shortcut to Constantinople. Of the thousand, thousands killed at Gallipoli, approximately 82 came from Greater Geelong, and I'm happy to be corrected on that one. That's, that's what I've calculated so far. Um, why does not God stop the war, wrote distracted mother to the Addy. If God can stop this war and will not, he's not a God to be loved. The unprecedented awfulness of this war was compelling the world to revise many of its ideas. But, but, this is the Addy, does it do any good to portray this great struggle as a sort of trade squabble? I wonder what sort of comfort this gives the many sad, bereaved mothers. 
Gradually, acrimony at the monumental miscalculation of Gallipoli was being replaced by a story of Australian fearlessness in the face of certain death. A soldier wrote, People at home, if only they knew how bravely they died, they would not grieve so much, but feel brave, feel proud that they've raised a son so brave. And you can see that this a, a, new, a new shaping, a new framing, and a, this new legend is forming here. Solace was sought in old certainties and new glories. So, uh, at least at this stage, you can see imperialism and nationalism sort of intertwining. The advertiser excoriated what it called the scoffers, who doubted the patriotism of the outer parts of empire. The, the Anzacs, it claimed, demonstrated deep and abiding attachment to the old land. There's been nothing better done in the whole war than the landing of the, Anzac, the Australians on the Gallipoli Peninsula. In the face of terrible and withering fire, our brave lads have shown fighting instincts worthy of the best tradition of British soldiers. The meaning of Gallipoli, it seems, was in the eye of the beholder. But, but again and again, certainly at this stage, the point was reiterated that on the peninsula, Australians had shown their worth as a people uh, and as a British nation. We rejoice that our brave boys who scaled the cliffs of Gallipoli and proved themselves worthy to rank with the finest heroes of the motherland that our raw battalions, without a single tradition or experience, proved as gallant and as steadfast as the English. Speakers in Geelong gave thanks to those who heard the call of empire and rallied round the grand old British flag. The motherland, it was said, appreciated the enthusiasm and devotion of the Australian troops. In the past, it was explained, there were those who were hesitant about our capabilities, our national powers, Australia was a child among the nations, youthful, untried. How would she face a national crisis? Australia gave her answer, full and fearless, and that answer, answer was Anzac. It was decreed that on the rugged, inhospitable peninsula, Australian tradition was born, ensuring that the story of Gallipoli would live in history. And they're writing this very, very very explicitly, so this, this story would be written in letters of gold, as they put it. A flood of, of publications commemorating the Gallipoli landing was released, including The Dardanelles, an epic tale told in pictures, Australasia Triumphant, Glorious Deeds of the Australasians, and probably in terminology we wouldn't be so inclined to use these days, Crusading at Anzac. Sergeant Hunter of Geelong received a letter from his son noting with a hint of astonishment that Australians are becoming... <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, lost my place. Australians are daily becoming more famous. Some sense of proportion needed to be maintained, others thought. So there's a little bit of, you know, toing and froing over this. Cario elector, Elector's suggestion that the man who puts on khaki, whatever his politics, is entitled to a seat in Parliament was considered to be asking rather too much. As the war dragged on, the story of the Gallipoli landing was fitted to other purposes. So with enlistments ticking over at about one or two per day, so the first two or three years, a special effort was organised to commemorate Anzac Week by special effort to stimulate recruiting. A common reprise was that the example of our Gallipoli heroes should be inspiring and cause all who enlist who feel call, cause all to enlist who feel impelled by patriotic motives. It should be an inspiration for duty. The military camp at the Geelong showgrounds was said to be a revelation with over 1,000 of Australia's bravest readying to maintain the high rep reputation that Australians have won by sheer merit at Gallipoli. With the war showing no signs of ending, however, the advertisers' exhortations shifted from patriotic fervour and pointing the finger of shame at shirkers, as it did in the first year or two, to resignation. So it kept, it kept sort of tried to drum up enthusiasm for enlistment, but it's, the language just really changed after Gallipoli. Um, so it started saying things like, look, men short of an eye or a limb are not eligible. Weaklings and rheumatics ought to be refused. Men on the edge of 
the age limit, men of doubtful health, they can be put to one side. Their turn will come, but no one is actually indispensable. Um, The story of Australia's participation in the First World War, familiar to many of us, is one of Australian mobilisation that was unified and spirited from the outset, followed by by astonishing displays of courage and loyalty in combat, which have come to be seen as defining national virtues. Close examination of reportage in Geelong during the war years reveals a somewhat more complex picture. You can see that pragmatism and stomach-nodding dread preceded the celebrated accounts of heroism under fire and manly adventure far from home. It should be remembered that this was a, a rural population struggling with drought and hardship, suddenly buoyed by this economic opportunity and now compelled to make profound choices about domestic, national and imperial obligations. This set of circumstances had no template for Geelongites, so we should not be surprised that their responses to the war were mixed. Some readily took up arms, some proclaimed unshakable empire enthusiasm, others engaged in racist conspiracy theories, or continued to enjoy footy matches, just as they'd always done. Those who returned to Geelong brought with them thrilling tales, but also trauma, which seeped into the wider community. Shocked by the frightening behaviour of her ex-serviceman husband, Annie Wade told the judge this, I don't think he was quite right in the head after he came back from the war. Lest we forget, indeed. Thank you very much. We move quickly then to our our final speaker, um, Bart Zeno. Bart's going to deliver a paper called Gallipoli and the Private War at Home. Bart's the author of a number of works on Australia in the First World War, including his books A Distant Grief, Australians, War Graves and the Great War, and the edited collection Remembering the First World War. Bart's taught history at Deakin for the past 10 years, and he's currently working on a book on private sentiment in Australia during the First World War. He's speaking on this theme today. Thanks, Bart. Thanks, David. I'm going to ride a bit, I guess, on the back of what Matt was saying earlier and and in terms of big picture uh, of what was going on at home. And what I want to do is sort of push further into that story and start to embroider some of the detail of uh, what was going on inside people's homes themselves. Uh, And in that sense, I guess that also uh, will give you some insight into how people reacted to the kinds of things that Dale was talking about going on uh, at the front itself. So for the most part, that means asking ourselves what it was like uh, for people in Australia as they learned about the Gallipoli campaign uh, and how they responded to its developments. Uh, the traditional view, as Matt was saying, is that Australians responded um, with extreme pride and even excitement uh, to the news of what had happened at Gallipoli. And what I want to suggest today is that even though Australians certainly were proud Uh, of those events, they were also struck uh, with a terrible fear about what was happening to their loved ones at the front. And that fear remains with those people uh, for the rest of the war, uh, unless it was the case, of course, that their loved one died, uh, in which case, well, fear uh, becomes something else entirely in terms of grieving. I also want to suggest that Australians were very much uh, aware of the nature of this war. They were not in the dark about what was going on and what it was like at the front. Uh, Though, again, the traditional suggestion here is that the newspapers kept the reality. Clearly, what Matt has shown us is that the newspapers could tell you uh, about what was going on uh, in some pretty gruesome terms sometimes. Uh, With that in mind, Australians also knew that the war was not going well in 1915. They did not look at this uh, as an easy task. Uh, And indeed, they were quite uh, clear that the war was, in fact, expanding in 1915 and moving beyond uh, control. Uh, So the final point I'll make uh, later on is that uh, when that campaign concludes in failure, what we tend to see in Australia uh, is a quiet acceptance that the campaign has failed. 
that it hasn't worked, uh, rather than perhaps the disappointment or even outrage that some expected people in Australia to express. We don't see that. Quiet acceptance is much more the case. Uh, so the main thing to bear in mind here uh, is that when we look at Gallipoli through this very personal lens, and I'm going to be relying on people's private letters, private diaries, uh, what we find is that Gallipoli is really the beginning of a very long and painful trial that certainly begins with Gallipoli but doesn't end uh, with the failure at Gallipoli. Uh, the war, of course, had started in August 1914, so some five months before uh, the commencement of the Gallipoli campaign. Uh, the impact is not felt so heavily uh, for Australians until April 1915, uh, but Australians had been watching this war with some alarm. And they were watching it with alarm uh, because the costs of it were very clear. 1914, um, by, by a large margin, is one of the most deadly years of the war. The scale of the casualties on the Western Front is quite extraordinary. Uh, so, of course, there's fear for what this might mean for their own men once they join the action. There's a great deal of anxiety already. Uh, what happens then at the end of April 1915 is... Very brief news that Australians are in action. It comes in just a very short little press release uh, that says, we are ashore at Gallipoli. You can see it there in terms of the, how it appeared in the Geelong Advertiser. I don't expect you to be able to read it. I just want you to see that that's all they learned about it. Uh, so they said they're ashore and that gave the British government's praise of what they called Australian splendid gallantry and magnificent achievement. That's what people knew. Uh, in Melbourne, and with his son likely to be involved, uh, John Melvin thought that that announcement, as he said, was sent to prepare us for sad news, as splendid gallantry and magnificent achievement must necessarily be accompanied by great sacrifice. Already they're ready for this sort of thing. Uh, also in Melbourne, John Roberts uh, thought that the news was less about stirling, stirring gallantry than its more personal implications. He wrote in his diary, McHenry, Sheldrake, Carl Jansen, etc., much in my thoughts. He's thinking about his friends. He's not thinking about what's going on. What follows is not more detail about what had happened. That takes uh, almost two weeks to arrive. What follows are casualty lists. Again, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but just to see that what people are learning comes in some very personal ways. They're issued at odd times through ensuing days. They're very inadequate. Uh, they mostly have the names of officers in them. Uh, what they can tell people, if, if the names are not there, are what units are involved in the fighting. So if one son is in the 7th Battalion, you can see that the 7th Battalion is involved, and you might even see that the 7th Battalion has suffered quite heavily. So people can read these lists in some quite intelligent ways. Uh, so even though they're mostly officers' names, Nellie Fisher, who was in Ascot Vale, knew that there must be more going on than what those lists uh, revealed. She wrote to her sweetheart, I've been thinking of you very much this week. Up till today, the total is 59 killed and 37 wounded, and nearly all those are officers, so there must be a terrible lot of privates wounded that we have not heard of. And people gain a sense of the scale of this event very quickly. John Roberts gets a phone call from his friend who says casualties are now up to 1,500. That's in the first few days. And he had already learnt five days before the first detailed report of what had happened came out, he had already learnt that his friend Carl Jansen had died of his wounds on the beach at Gallipoli. Uh, he was a bit further up, that's why he wasn't in Dale's picture with the one man there. Uh, so without that further detail of what had happened, anxiety is very much unrelieved. Victoria's Director of Education, Frank Tate, uh, sensed that what was happening here was a much more intense focus on the war amongst people in Victoria. Uh, but all that was certain, he said, was that the first casualty lists have been published and there is gloom everywhere. Gloom everywhere. The wildest rumours are being circulated most of us are keeping our minds in a state of suspended judgment and hoping for the best. So the first account of the landing at Gallipoli uh, is published on the 8th of May. It comes from the English correspondent Ellis Ashmead Bartlett. 
uh, and it eulogises the Australians, as he put it, as a race of athletes. It says great things about what they'd achieved. Um, that report, as important as it was, rates no mention in Thomas Purcell's diary. He's a market gardener out in Footscray. Uh, what his diary reflects is the growing realisation of the scale of losses and the bare detail, as he put it, that one of the Walters got his arm blown off at the Dardanelles, several of the Footscray boys wounded, over 1,000 casualties up to the present date. You get a sense of this. I mean, if we've got news today that 1,000 people have been killed and wounded uh, in battle, we too would be shocked. So even after those reports start to flow in, start to tell people about what had happened at the landing, uh, individuals and families are still remaining very firmly fixed on the casualty lists. One woman told her friend, our first thought is for the lists, which are greedily scanned. Every morning, sorry, every evening, Margaret Melvin, with her son at the front, received the extraordinary issues of the newspapers. They were coming out at much more regular intervals. Uh, and she opened them with trepidation. She said, it is an awful moment whilst reading the casualties. We just live from morning to night and night to morning in the hope and trust that no news is good news. And I think it is under the circumstances. So the point here is that the Gallipoli landings are the cue for some excitement, uh, some relief that the Australians uh, had apparently done well. And there are certainly those who spoke about the Anzacs in very uh, glorious terms. Uh, but they are also the cue for escalating anxiety in Australia. And it's going to keep going up. Uh, those who were thinking about loved ones were having a pretty harrowing time about this. I'm going to quote Margaret Melvin again. We are passing through a time of terrible anxiety just now, she wrote to her son. And it is you, dear son, who is ever in our minds, our hearts and prayers. We do not know where you are or how you are. It is very hard writing tonight, but of course we keep hoping and trusting all is well with you, our dear, dear son. Now, all was not well uh, with John Melvin, uh, but his parents wouldn't know for months that he had been killed uh, at the landing on the first day. And so it's a terrible string of letters that they keep writing to their son. The problem then for understanding more about what was going on at Gallipoli uh, is that there is no personal or individual news of the fighting coming for weeks. And I mean this in the terms of letters that people start to write. The only news you're going to get is a report of death or wounding. Uh, by the end of May, the casualty lists testified to over 4,000 Australians killed or wounded. And indeed, those lists exposed the contours of the, uh, the early part of the campaign for those at home much more immediately and perhaps uh, more accurately than the reports of the major correspondents. People could tell from those lists what was going on in terms of its scale. So too, as they began to arrive... Uh, the letters from the front began to find their way into the local and the metropolitan press. Again, Matt has told us about some of these letters. And some of those letters could be particularly graphic, okay, despite the constraints of censorship. As it happens, the censors at the front um, who went over these letters were mostly interested in the units uh, that were fighting and where they were. They didn't want the enemy to get that sort of information. So they don't edit these things uh, particularly harshly. One of Chaplain William Mackenzie's first letters from Gallipoli, for instance, described the brutality of war, telling his wife that Australia will be shocked when they get the full particulars about it. They have well nigh accomplished the impossible, but at a fearful cost. Still, don't make this public or show the letter. Uh, now, what we can see here, of course, is that despite that kind of caution, that sort of private knowledge of the war circulates <coughs> very freely in Australia. Some of it makes its way into the press. Uh, other letters are circulated, copied by families, they're circulated around families. Uh, and so they, the word makes its way around. What happens from the middle of 1915 is that just as those letters are coming back, the ships bringing the letters are also beginning to bring those who are too sick or who are wounded and can't return to the front. Men begin to return to Australia from Gallipoli and they're showing the signs of that war on their bodies. 
you can see it. Some people have no leg, some people have no eye, some are too unwell to walk. And they are bringing stories that can't be censored uh, as well. So, according to two men who had been at the landing, Albert Berend of Melbourne uh, met them on the train, he said, they told me that it is hell on earth there. Uh, and even to look at these people, it could be quite confronting, even from a distance. For Sarah Simonson in Melbourne, as she said, the returned wounded give one the creeps. They all look so thin and worn out. So what I'm suggesting here is that people in Australia were able to learn about the events of the war uh, through both official and unofficial channels. And they could tell that things were not necessarily going well for the Allies. And it wasn't just that the newspapers lied and the soldiers' letters told the truth. It was quite easy to see from the newspapers that progress was not being made. While the Anzacs struggled uh, at Gallipoli, on the Western Front, the action around Ypres in Belgium had been brutal and costly. The Germans had uh, used poison gas there uh, in significant quantities. Uh, in the East, there was growing doubt about how well the Russian army uh, was fighting against the Germans. And so you get Arthur Hunter out in Gippsland taking up the Melbourne Argus on 3rd of July 1915. And he writes in his diary, War news not good. Russians driven back a long way, and in France no headway made, and the Dardanelles much the same. Italy joining in seems to have made no difference yet. So Australians knew in mid-1915 that the war situation was very serious. Rather than recoiling from it uh, and trying to hide themselves away, however, the response to that knowledge was a really extraordinary mobilisation of people and resources all across the country. Referring to what he called his very mixed feelings in response to the war, the Melbourne doctor Felix Meyer told John Monash that the losses at the front, as he said, have stirred up people here as nothing else could have done. In a broader sense, Frank Tate thought that indifferent news from all the fronts was also impacting. Our folk, he said, are getting very restive. I think there is a determination to get busy and do things. So that's the response to this bad news, is to uh, escalate one's commitment to the war. What did they do uh, in response? There are two things uh, in the main. One response... Uh, we can see in enlistments for the Australian Imperial Force. The other main one is the proliferation of patriotic work and fundraising. Uh, at a very personal level, military-aged men were feeling a real tension here between duty to home and duty to the Empire at war. And as that first news of the landing filters through, the 19-year-old Malcolm Sterling, who was at Melbourne University, wrote to his mother that the war, instead of getting better is getting blacker every day, and I think it is the duty of every responsible person to do his share. The period after the landing scene is a really quite uncomfortable one uh, for many young men. Uh, one put it that he felt very unsettled, uh, and indeed he said, ashamed of myself for not taking my part in the struggle in which so many Australians are engaged. Elsewhere, uh, what we see is a uh, much greater contribution of time, money, and labour to patriotic organisations like the Red Cross, uh, but certainly not just the Red Cross. There's an extraordinary number of patriotic organisations out there. And what we see is that ordinary people are looking for outlets for their feelings. I'll give you an example. Uh, Arthur Fry in Sydney had two sons away, and he was looking for ways of settling his frustrations about how he could contribute to the war. And this is what he wrote to his son at the war. I feel almost guilty that I can't do more myself. But it's not my fault I'm 65. I certainly couldn't carry a kit one day's march, nor sight a gun at anything smaller than a haystack. All I can do is to make my little contribution to the fund. You see the frustration here uh, from this man. Beyond giving money, uh, the volunteering of time and labour does help to ameliorate the sense of powerlessness that people like Arthur Fry were feeling. Here, let's see if I can make this work here, we've got people working at the Geelong Red Cross, making up bandages, um, sewing and so forth. Um, the image that we tend to have 
uh, of, of women's work in the war is, is of course, knitting. Uh, and, it, you know, I mean, we might regard this as, you know, well, that's what, a bit trite, or well, women knitted. Of course, they did lots of other things. But uh, knitting, in fact, was ubiquitous and public. This is what you saw women doing. Matilda Roth told her cousin that we are all knitting as hard as we can. In the trams and trains, it is not unusual sight to see a ball of wool roll under the seat and two or three people rescuing it. Young women, previously uh, unable to knit, uh, were now desperately trying to master turning the heel uh, on socks. Despite those kinds of frustrations that people were feeling, uh, work like that could help to make people feel that they were genuinely contributing to the war effort. And more importantly for some, it could also help to relieve the tension of waiting uh, through the distraction of what they were doing. So we have Rose Keast in Broken Hill waiting for news of her son. And she says, while I am working, it keeps me from thinking of my own troubles. Right? So knitting is a distraction from people with great levels of anxiety. Uh, so by the middle of 1915, Australians are really trying to cope with a whole series of mixed emotions, and they include not only anxiety, grief and pride, but also fear and anger. And those feelings increase their determination to contribute the war on, to the war on one hand, uh, but they also encouraged criticisms of their fellow citizens whom they deemed not to be contributing to the war sufficiently. Now, that's especially the case for military-aged men uh, who had not enlisted. Again, Matt talked about these people. The sending of white feathers um, was not as widespread as we might think, but it wasn't unknown uh, either. And in any case, it was only the tip of the iceberg in terms of public pressure to enlist. And that became much more forceful and organised uh, with the first recruiting campaigns uh, coming into vogue here. Uh, we've got a couple of posters here from the early recruiting campaigns in 1915. Uh, and we've got a positive message here in one sense. Go to the war, uh, join with your friends, do something great. They've got an image of uh, Lieutenant Jacker, VC, here. Say, be like him, emulate this man. And on the other slide, of course, uh, a rather more negative uh, motivation in terms of you know, the diminishing uh, and wearying men at the front thinking about all of those who are at the race course or at the football who ought to be doing their duties. There's a shame principle involved in all, all of this. The point here uh, is then that while on one hand people were showing greater commitment to the war, they were also increasingly willing to uh, accuse men of neglecting their duty. And there's an extraordinary, I use this word a lot, but there really is an extraordinary response in the middle of 1915 to these recruiting campaigns, especially in Victoria, uh, where in July 1915 we have something like 20,000 enlistments. It's the greatest number in a month for the entirety of the war. Uh, and so you might, if you were in Australia at that time, say, gee, we're really uh, getting stuck into this. Uh, and yet, despite the acknowledgement, uh, as he put it, that most people are busy doing something the businessman Richard Taylor could still charge that all the same, we still have too many shirkers or cold feet. So just at that moment when it looks like Australians are really starting to pull their weight, they're also criticising each other about their failures. And while those kinds of attitudes were then beginning to poison personal and communal relationships, uh, they were also encouraged by growing acceptance that this was going to be a long war. People were starting to accept. They had hoped. I never come across the term over by Christmas, actually. In all the work I've ever done, I've never found anyone say this war is going to be over by Christmas. But they did hope that it would end suddenly. Right? It had seemed to start very quickly. There were those who hoped it would end very quickly. By the middle of 1915, people are giving up on that idea that it's going to end quickly. In fact, from the very beginning of 1915, that war had threatened to expand. Uh, and that included the Allied plan to force the Dardanelles. It included speculation that the Bulgarians, Greeks and Italians would join either the Allies or the Central Powers. 
And while that had the allure of opening up a route to victory by opening a new front, by the end of the year, uh, the entry into the war of new belligerents like the Greeks, the Bulgarians, the Romanians, uh, what that indicated to people was a much more bewildering sense of the all-encompassing grasp of the war. So even as the Allies had established themselves on the Gallipoli Peninsula, doubts about the imminence of success had begun to grow with people. Here, here is oh, Margaret Stanley, Lady Margaret Stanley, uh, wife of the governor. Wrote a whole series of letters back to her mother in England about what was going on in Australia. And in June 1915, she wrote back to her mother, somehow in the last few weeks, one has felt less sanguine as to the end of the war coming this year. It's starting to dawn on them. It's not going to end quickly. By mid-August, Frank Tate was a little less than confident. He found the outlook as depressing as ever. It was difficult, he wrote, to keep one's equanimity and believe that time is going to work out all things for us on the right side. So even the faith that this is going to work out well is starting to diminish in 1915. Australians had begun to accept then that the war was not going to end suddenly or even necessarily successfully. Nevertheless, such acceptance only grew in tandem with a determination to carry on with the war. In Sydney, H.A. Twybee observed that, quote, without this Without doubt, this dreadful war is turning everything upside down. But of course, it has to be fought to a finish and everything else has to take a second place. Right? So the war must be prioritised above all things. Attentive readers of the press would understand that the news from Gallipoli hardly suggested anything else was happening. The casualty lists testified to the terrible costs of the August offensive and soldiers' letters following those offensives expressed some brutal truths about the failure. Uh, and it's in that context that we can begin to understand why Australians took uh, rather a sober uh, attitude towards the winding up of the campaign. Uh, it is also in that context that we can understand their reactions to the expansion of the war and how terrible this all seemed. In October, uh, Bulgaria entered the conflict. British troops occupied Salonika. The Greeks and the Romanians uh, continued to vacillate. So now, instead of this expansion being welcomed as a way of uh, opening up new fronts and hopefully ending the war quickly, uh, this all came as a sign that the war had in fact taken on a life of its own and was getting out of control, that it wasn't going to end. Margaret Stanley now likened the war as she put it, to the spreading of some horrible and hideous disease. Edmund Milne had a son at Gallipoli. He was resigned. He found people depressed with the news of Bulgaria and Greece. We recognise every prospect of a longer term of purgatory, which this war means. The whole civilised world appears to be affected with the bloodlust. Oh, well, we are in the ring and it's a fight to the finish. So again, there's no withdrawing here from the war. This is about committing to something that they still know is terrible and that they're not very keen on. And events at Gallipoli only reinforced that attitude. Whether the press had deceived people or not, by November 1915, uh, it was common to discuss Gallipoli in terms of a blunder. It's very open. Again, Matt showed us what the Geelong advertiser was saying about Gallipoli around that time. Uh, and that's especially clear once General Ian Hamilton has been removed uh, from command. Arthur Hunter now recorded in his diary that it seems the Dardanelles campaign was a foolish undertaking, according to what we read. No longer burdened with expectations of foreshortening the war, uh, Gallipoli now assumed much more alarming proportions as a potential massacre for remaining Allied forces, should they try and withdraw. And again, that's why I think we have that muted response to the ending of the campaign. Jack Strong in Sydney heard the news of the withdrawal and he thought that it was, he said, hard lines to have to give up there after all the fight our chaps have shown. But it's no use squealing. And Edmund Milne, again, he had that son at Gallipoli, uh, was in fact deeply relieved to hear about the end of the campaign, even though it had failed. He said, Anzac is a memory, not a nightmare. I and thousands of others, and he means parents, need not now grit our teeth and hold in when that awful beach is mentioned. 
What then had Gallipoli meant on personal levels? The war had expanded and deepened for Australians in 1915, and yet, when confronted with the realities and costs of war, Australians persisted in their determination to fight. Anxiety and the effects of loss at the front powerfully reinforced that commitment, but they also provided the conditions for recrimination and division. At the end of Gallipoli, Australians had come out of the experience even more deeply committed to a war that was still getting bigger. They were more willing to criticise their fellow citizens for their perceived failures, and they were carrying a burden of fear and anxiety that threatened to overwhelm them as they hoped and waited for it all to end. In April 1916, they would mark the anniversary of the Gallipoli landings for the first time, and they would speak fine words about their Anzac heroes. But they also remembered that Gallipoli had begun a trial for them, and that that trial was not over yet. Thank you.